you know, they're telling me to bet on the game while I'm watching the game. Uh, we, we know that. Uh, I, I forget the numbers, but it's something like five in New Jersey's data, five, 60 percent of expenditures come from five percent of users. Like those are problem gamblers. They will lose all their money. Some of them will uh, do serious harm to their lives. Some of them will commit suicide. This has been the experience of the UK that legalized sports gambling 15 years ago. It's extremely bad. It's a very standard what happens when you let big retailers sell addictive substances. Hello, everybody. Thanks for tuning into The Glenn Show. I'm Glenn Lowry. Uh, I'm a professor at Brown University and a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute, which sponsors The Glenn Show. And it's my pleasure to be talking uh, today with Charles Fane Lehman, uh, who is a fellow at the Manhattan Institute, uh, writes largely about uh, policing and public safety issues, although not exclusively so, uh, has a background in journalism, came to MI. Uh, from the Free Beacon, uh, Washington Free Beacon, and has published in um, a number of uh, uh, notable outlets like the Wall Street Journal, National Review, and so on about crime policing and related issues. So welcome to the show. I'm Charles. Thanks, uh, thanks. Thanks for having me on. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm very excited to be here. I'm a, you know, I'm a longtime listener, first time uh, caller. As it were. <laughs> well, no, you're not a caller. They'll be calling you. <laughs> <laughs> Stay tuned to the comment section. So I heard that the governor of New York, I don't know a lot about this, has ordered uh, National Guardsmen into the subways of the city. I know you don't live in New York City. You live in suburban D.C., I understand. But in any case, what's up with uh, crime control issues and policing in New York? Yeah, well, and you know, I think I think there's been pretty uniform criticism of uh, of Hochul's move on the subway, both from the left and from the right. So you know, sort of standard, you say standard progressive criticism, but also several of our colleagues at the Manhattan Institute have come out and said this is kind of silly. Um, look, you know, there's this clearly a politics angle to it where. Uh, crime in the subway, specific kinds of crime in the subway are an issue. There's been, for example, the sort of most startling indicator is that the number of homicides in the subway has gone up notably in the past several years, and there seems to be some reversion. Um, and then you also see uh, increases in other kinds of offenses, although it varies by offense. And it's also clearly more of a problem with serious mental illness in the subway, unhoused homelessness in the subway. Um, so I think, you know, People are often freaked out on the subway. That is something that affects their political behaviors. The governor of New York almost lost a close race a couple of years ago to a Republican yeah. challenger who ran largely on public safety. Bluntly, I think that if Lee Zeldin, who is the Republican nominee, hadn't also voted against impeaching Trump, uh, he probably would have won. Or, you know, maybe he, he, he had a slightly, he was slightly more credible in claiming not to be pro-life. He probably would have won. It's like that close in bright blue New York. So anyway, Hochul, uh, Kathy Hochul, the governor, very concerned about this. Um, you know, I think at the end of the day, a lot of the problems that the subway is currently seeing, a part of this, this sort of uh, bump in crime that many large cities saw in the wake of 2020 that's sort of coming down, um, local to New York specifically, it's also a function of limitations put in place in the criminal justice system over the past four to five years on how effectively the criminal justice system can specifically deal with uh, high frequency repeat offenders, where you get like that small subpopulation who counts for a large share of the crime. You look at people who will get picked up for uh, a dozen instances, multi, you know, more than a dozen instances of offending in the subway, We're not just, you know, hopping turnstiles, people who have assaulted MTA officers or back out on the streets. Um, and if you talk to the people who run the criminal justice system in New York, they'll say it's much harder to incapacitate that population than it was five years ago, both because of the broader criminal justice environment, but also because of specific legal changes that I think a lot of people are concerned about now. Like what? Well, so part of the story, the one that everyone has most heard about is what's called bail, is bail reform, um, is that it is much harder to detain people pre-trial uh, in New York State. Um, there's a limited set of cases in which judges can impose uh, can impose cash bail or remand people. Pretty much otherwise, people have to be released. Um, but bail reform is actually really only part of the equation. So the, the one that really doesn't get enough attention is discovery reform. 
uh, the state legislature imposed on DAs. Basically, there's a clock that runs um, during the discovery process in... in let's back up a little just a little bit for for the listeners um so so in this in in the course of prosecuting a criminal offense you have to go through all the relevant materials that's the process of discovery um all of the documents that are generated by the prosecution have to be turned over to the defense and there's a limited time in which the prosecution can do that and if the prosecution doesn't do that then the the case can end up dismissed. The number of documents that the prosecution has to turn over to the defense has been increased, and the amount of time that they have to do it has been decreased. And as a result, you see a substantial increase in the total number of cases that are getting dismissed yeah. in New York. I see. Um, so that's you know another contributor to making the criminal justice system run more slowly. Um, you see this but, in parole and probation reform. That's been a major issue. The, the sort of common theme is that it's much harder to incapacitate people than it used to be. Okay. Uh, let me just review this to make sure I'm following. So we started out talking about subway, and you made the observation that a lot of the offenses from uh, high-frequency repeat offenders, and the question comes, how can they be incapacitated? So that presumes that, quote, a solution to the problem would be um, to identify and incapacitate the source of the majority of the offending, which is a relatively few people, um, and now there are problems in doing that. There's bail reform problems and there's the prosecutorial accountability or whatever problems. And uh, there's also parole. And uh, so, I mean, here's what the uh, anti-incarceration types would say. I can imagine that that's not a solution to the problem. Uh, and... Uh, they're going to also invoke some rights arguments about uh, pretrial detention and things of this kind and uh, wondering whether or not there aren't any interventions other than incarceration that could could be effective. So I assume you're going to dismiss those counter arguments. I, I, I'd like to give you the opportunity to do so. Yeah. So there was um, there's some recent analysis looking at bail reform specifically. Uh, one of the one of the organizations that was involved in advising advising. Uh, the initial rollout of legislation, they sort of shifted from there to doing research as a third-party uh, academic entity. It doesn't really matter. But looking at the effects of bail reform and what they in New York, and what they find is that on average, bail reform appears to be having relatively little effect on reoffending. Um, people who would have been detained pre-trial before bail reform and are getting out now because of bail reform, are not more likely to, appreciably more likely to offend. Except when you look at the frequent offender population, when you look at people who are serious violent offenders, who have a bunch of, have a relatively high number of prior offenses, like that population of people are, uh, they, they, they are negatively affected or, you know, their, their risk of reoffending is going up post bail reform. Um, so I think what you see you know, what, 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 what I would say, I would say two things. When we're talking about sort of prudential concerns, I would say it is entirely possible to make the criminal justice system less punitive on the extensive margin, to reduce the amount that you're punishing the first-time offender, the infrequent offender, if you really focus, and, and not see an increase in crime, if you really focus on the subpopulation who are frequent offenders, the people who are committing the lion's share of crime, the you know, it's 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 a power law thing. The twenty percent of the population of offenders who are doing eighty percent of the offending. Um, if you are like you can't, you know, a I think everyone, but most people agree that crime is bad. But even if you don't, from a political perspective, uh, reform is not sustainable if your reform causes crime to go up. But if your reform is conscious of that difference in behavior, then it is reasonable to you you you, you should expect your reform to be successful without crime going up. You can have less crime and less punishment, or at least the same level of crime and less punishment if you're smart about it. That's sort of the utilitarian argument. There's also the, you know, th there's a rights-based argument, right? Or there's, there's you know, really sort of a, when we talk specifically about bail reform, this like pretrial detention, you know, people who are in pretrial detention are presumptively innocent, and also it's really, you know, ba bail reform is really just, or b bail is really just punishing people for being poor. Yeah. My response to that is, Okay, so my response to the second thing is there may be jurisdictions where bail is punishing people for being poor, but like New York is not one of them. Um, people mostly were able to post bail 
Um, they were mostly able to get out when they were detained on when once they'd been detained on bail. And there doesn't appear to be an appreciable change in, for example, the racial composition post bail. This is one of the interesting things: is that uh, the effect that your race that race has on your risk of being detained has not appreciably changed since bail reform. The racial composition of Rikers Island, for example, hasn't appreciably changed. But then there's also this argument, you know, we just don't think people should be detained pre-trial. And my response is like, yeah. we've detained people pre-trial in, in the English common law system for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, like, it's not as though people are held pre-trial on no evidence, right? Like, a, right. a, a, a cop had to have probable cause to arrest them. They had to go before a judge. The judge had to arraign them, make a decision. Like, they have process. They now, are now, entitled well, to a speed trial. That's an issue, but... Let me, let me just ask you, what's to stop a court under current uh, bail uh, uh, rules from discriminating amongst uh, those who have been detained and not granting bail in the case where a person has a frequent offending track record, uh, but being more liberal about granting bail in cases where a person might have been suspect, suspected of a real crime but uh, doesn't have that kind of a record? Why, why can't we discriminate in the application of uh, the bail reform relief? So with the, the, the really big thing, and this was actually true before bail reform, the really big thing is that New York State is the only state in the union which does not permit detaining people on the basis of their threat to the public or the risk of committing another crime. Under New York's bail laws before bail reform, you could only detain people if they were thought to be a flight risk. And that's like sort of the macro issue that was true before, it's true after. What bail reform has done is it's sort of further entrenched that where there's a limited set of crimes for which bail is on the table at all. They've expanded this a little bit. They've said there are certain narrow circumstances in which you can impose bail for certain kinds of offenders. In some cases, I don't think that covers uh, sort of the breadth of, for example, high-frequency misdemeanors who are a whole separate category, but that's all sort of constrained by before and after bail reform, judges still can only, in theory, consider what is going to make sure that this person shows up to court next week or at his next court date. They are, they are prohibited by law uh, from considering, will this stop them from reoffending? If you ask judges, if you ask DAs, they'll say, we do consider this. Like, in spite of the text of what the law says, we do consider this is true. But it is much less formalized and the fact that the law pushes in that direction is going to end up affecting their behavior. Now, I talked to uh, Matt Martins is his name. He's a lawyer uh, in D.C. who has got a book out called Reforming Criminal Justice, a Christian Proposal. He was a guest here on the show not that long ago. And he was uh, very uh, agitated about uh, pretrial detention and about uh, the fact that it takes so long for uh, trials to be uh, taken, you know, having enough. He said, if uh, I, I asked him, I said, suppose you're a victim of somebody who's got a track record, who's been apprehended and who's been let out uh, uh, on uh, no uh, pretrial detention. Uh, you're going to feel, you know, victimized by that. You're going you're gonna to feel uh, that the system isn't serving you very well and politicians are going to respond to that. And, and his answer was something like, well, if they could have the trials more quickly, I wouldn't necessarily be as adamant about uh, not holding people in advance of, uh, of a verdict that, uh, or whatever. But it takes so long for the process to clear. What do you think about that? I mean, I, I, I actually agree with him, um, specifically with regards to speedy trials. And, I, you know, I'd say a couple of things. One is that there's a constitutional right to speedy trials. And what that means is a little different from how fast the trial goes. It's like you have to take due haste. Um, but there, there is, in theory, enshrined in our Constitution an expectation of speedy trial. Speedy trials are important for victims because they get justice. They're important for criminals because they're entitled to, uh, they're, they're entitled to a fast trial. Uh, they're important for general deterrence, right? It, like, you know, go to, go to the Becker model of punishment. Um, deterrence is a function of uh, severity, swiftness, and certainty. Swiftness is a key component. If you can make punishment happen faster, you deter better. Um, and they're important for the government because long trials cost the government and therefore taxpayers lots of money. Um, that is easier said than done. Uh, you know, an, an underrated, something I've written a lot about for the Manhattan Institute and elsewhere, I wrote this in The Atlantic um, with, with Raihan Salam, uh, who runs the Manhattan Institute, is uh, 
there are many components of the criminal justice system in America that are uh, slow, underfunded, that operate relatively inefficiently. And our courts are one example. We have many thousands of courts. Many of them are quite small. They operate quite slowly. They often use antiquated technology. It's also the case that there's a stu- there's research funded by uh, the Lauren John Arler Foundation that looks into this and finds that judges themselves have gotten a lot slower. They are not following national they're not following national standards for case processing. They just like, like stuff is taking longer than it used to, holding all other factors equal. Um, so there's there's been a loss of sort of knowledge about how to get people through the system faster. That's like a very technical answer. I agree with him. I think that solving those problems is both worthwhile and very hard. But that there are real benefits to, well, there are real benefits to pretrial detention within a restricted population of offenders. Um, the last thing, you know, the other thing I'll say is we have good evidence, we have good econo- econometric evidence that on average, pretrial detention is probably not a good idea. That unlike prison, jail is probably criminogenic at the margins, probably because it reduces your employment possibilities. Um, that means we should err on the side of not detaining people pre-trial. But as I've argued, and I can get to this argument at length, that probably doesn't hold for frequent, hard to deter, uh, otherwise highly crime-prone offenders. Um, and those people, yeah, you like kind of want to deter, you kind of want to detain them as much as possible, um, just because if you leave them on the street, they end up committing more crimes. Uh, so yeah, I mean, look, like, 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 I think he's right that that is a solution. I would, you know, it's very easy to say it. It's much harder to do it, particularly in a criminal justice system as fragmented as ours, ours is. But it is worth trying to do if we accept that pretrial detention will still be very necessary. Where are you on the plea bargaining phenomenon? So many cases being resolved without actually having a jury involved. Um, you know. I think a lot of the concern about this is based on scare stories. Um, it is clearly the case that some people are pushed into taking deals that they wouldn't otherwise. It's also the case that if you look into the evidence that undergirds many criminal offenses or many criminal charges, they like kind of know who did it. They kind of are aware uh, who the offender is, and they usually have pretty good evidence to support it. And the, the simple logic... Uh, have have you ever read um, Tom Wolfe's Bonfire of the Vanities? Oh yeah, I love a that classic book. book. A classic book, um, and you know, one of the things that Wolfe observes in Bonfire of the Vanities, you know, he, one of his main characters is a prosecutor, and he's like, "Look, the job of a prosecutor is not like you know high glamour nailing the criminal. The job of the prosecutor is they bring in another truckload of guys who have committed the same horrible offenses. You have lots of evidence that they did it, and you just sort of churn them through. It is not glamorous. It is unpleasant." But by the same token, when people say, you know, the, the plea bargain rate is 90, 95%, like one interpretation is they're using plea bargains coercively. Another interpretation is like, uh, if you thought you could take it to trial, like, you know, but criminal offenders often have bad judgment as to their own uh, chances in life. If they didn't, they wouldn't be criminal offenders. They wouldn't think that they could get lucky. And so it is, it is, I think, hard to believe that criminal offenders are behaving rationally when they go, I could get five now or 20 later, I'm going to go for five. Because what is in character for them is just to say, I'm going to try to get off free, um, unless you can really nail the guy. So, you know, I'm, like, like, I think that those high rates of plea bargaining are reflective of, A, high underlying rates of, like, there's a lot of crime that prosecutor's office have to deal with somehow, and B, the fact that most of those are good cases. Are they all good cases? No. Like a lot of them are. Uh, let me change the subject a little bit. What do you think uh, the summer of 2020 has done to um, the public safety scene in big cities in America? Yeah. So, you know, it's gotten worse. Things are getting better now, which is good. Um, and what I what I like to point out is that we have ex- we we've sort of experienced bursts of increases, particularly in violent crime. Um, like property offending stayed low, actually declined. I mean, it declined during COVID, uh, mostly because there were fewer opportunities to victimize, and it sort of stayed low. If you look at violent crime and then also car theft, um, but this is actually you know so to look at the homicide rate, 
spikes in 2020 and then sort of been slowly mean reverting. We're probably not back to 2019 levels, but we're back to where we were. This is exactly what happened in 2014, 2015, 2016 with the Ferguson protests. Um, but Holly Heather McDonald has talked about as the Ferguson effect. Um, the reason I bring this up is that, you know, I don't think that we have seen, we, we're not seeing crime rates, violent crime rates, like we saw in the 1970s, 1980s, right? Between 1965 and about 1995, uh, violent crime rose more or less continuously for 30 years. Um, a lot of that phenomenon was what I was talking about. Know, the best estimate of half of that phenomenon is like was demographic structural. And what I mean by that is like there were a lot of young people, right? The baby boomers aged into and out of crime. Um, the demographic determinants, the sort of structural determinants of crime still militate in favor of a relatively low crime rate. America's population is graying. We're more obese. We're more sedentary. We have lots of, you know, we're on more drugs. We have lots more electronic distractions. Lots of things militate towards a comparatively lower crime level. But we get these bursts now where like, for political reasons, and we get into the reasons because I think you know COVID plays a role too. But for for exogenous political reasons, there is a drawdown in the capacity of the criminal justice system to exercise social control, and that is reflected in a short run sort of burst of activity, particularly in violence, particularly in you know the kind of behavior that drives most homicidal violence and shootings in the United States, which is like high levels of conflict between small social networks, primarily composed of young men with guns. Um, and I think, yeah. you you know, when you when you take that social control model, it makes a lot of sense to go, A, summer 2020, uh, there were, A, there, there were already massive disruptions to schools, jails, and courts, three institutions of social control. Because of COVID. That with, sorry? Because of COVID. Because of COVID. Compound that with a large movement that was actively hostile to the police that led to reductions in police funding in some cities, but in many major cities, reductions specifically in police staffing levels. Um, that's followed by a major burst in violent activity. Many cities have gotten it under control. Not all of them have gotten it under control. I'm outside of D.C., DC still has a major crime problem and a violent crime problem. And if you look at the underlying determinants, it's because police activity levels haven't recovered, prosecution levels remain low, jail population is slowly ticking up. Um, but like they, they they have not adapted their capacity to that increase in bad behavior among the people who drive violent crime rates. So that's interesting, if I understood you. The baseline long-term determinants of criminal offending give you reason to think it would be trending down, but the episodic political, social upheavals and the reactions of the system with all of its warts to those upheavals uh, create episodic uh, detrend or away from trend movements that look like spikes. And then that ends up being the thing that we talk about. Crime is up. Violent crime is up. Who's doing it right? What you know is Chicago Mayor uh, Brandon Johnson is New Orleans. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there's a debate in D.C. Isn't there the city council and the mayor not necessarily on the same page, uh, or is there? I mean, I'm I'm asking. And 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 what about yeah. New York City? Um, I was laughing at Chicago. Whenever I talk to Chicago, I say that, like the best thing that could happen for public for crime and public safety in Chicago is to get another cow to kick over another candle. Um, like, oh, that's not funny, man. That's my hometown. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, Chicago has such deeply entrenched... First of all, Chicago has deeply entrenched culture of gang violence, incredibly hard to extirpate. And second of all, uh, look, I, I'm, I'm more pro-cop than the average like college-educated American under the age of 30. And I think Chicago PD is a mess. Um, like, It's really hard to fix it. Um, so, you know... It, what I would say that that's why I was laughing at Chicago. I don't think Brandon Johnson is helping. Brandon Johnson is this model of like, you know, we're going to hug our way to solutions. Um, so talking about a city, like, you know, I think the way that DC is getting things wrong is also interesting. Um, you know, I talked a minute ago. My model is often just about you know the intensity of the intensity of enforcement along different dimensions. So how, not just, you know, how aggressive enforcement is, but like, what is your enforcement risk? 
Um, how likely are you to be caught if you offend? Um, how quickly will you? Uh, right? Let's go. You know, scrap the certainty severity. Um, the certainty of being caught has declined in DC, and the certainty of being prosecuted, conditional on being caught, has declined substantially in DC. Here in DC, they're like having these debate. You can go look at the city council and the mayor, and they're going back and forth about how stringent should the sentencing standards be? Should we raise the ma- statutory maximum, or should we lower the statutory maximum? And it's like. Nobody gets the statutory maximum for a crime. It doesn't matter. I mean, sure, do it. But they're thinking about the severity of enforcement. They're not thinking about the certainty of enforcement. And they're ignoring the question of, uh, you know, why, has our, why have our police staffing numbers declined? And is that the real problem? Why aren't we prosecuting people? Is that the real problem? Um, you know, New York does seem to be making strides in the right direction. Things are trending down. That's good. Uh, they are supported by the fact that, you know, New York has 40,000 police officers. That's four times bigger than the next largest police force, which is either, I think it's either CPD or LAPD, but I can't remember which one. Um, there are many cities that are experiencing, like, mean reversion, where things sort of went crazy for a while, and now they've gotten better. Um, Dallas, I'm optimistic about, uh, the number of Texas cities actually, um, a lot. And look, a lot of what those cities are doing is a, they are winning the race to hire cops where they are not losing the race of cops fleeing to the suburbs. They've made it attractive for cops to stay there and work there. And then B, they are just like using what are proven strategies for effective policing. Um, I was just in Chattanooga, Tennessee yesterday, two days ago. Uh, and in Chattanooga, they are they they have a serious long term gang violence problem. Um, they had the same spike as everyone else, and they are just now starting to implement a number of effective crime reducing solutions. Which I'm pretty optimistic. Like, I think there's some other things that they could do, and they clearly have problems. But like, you know, I think that they will probably bring the crime rate down somewhat, and that's good. Um, so it's like there are tools on the table, and the question is just like, do you choose to use them or not? And do the political environment does the political environment militate in favor of using them or not? So police staffing is a problem, but some cities are handling that problem better than others. What does that mean? What are they doing? The the ones who are able to successfully attract uh, officers, and uh, what are the other cities not doing? You know that kind of thing. Yeah. So some some of it's some of it's uh, wages, right? Um, many cities are now floating fairly attractive bonuses for hiring or uh, are, are substantial. You know, you can make six figures uh, two years out of the academy as a cop now. And, you know, that's eaten away by inflation somewhat, but it's still pretty good for what is a blue collar job. Um, that said, wages never, you know, totally cut it. Um, a, uh, a friend of mine, Ian Adams, who's a criminal, he's a criminal, he's an ex-cop turned criminologist, and he observes, I think, insightfully that the minimum wage for uh, policing will always for for hiring additional officer will always be set by the cost, the equivalent of the cost of training one of your own. So you're you're competing you're competing for a fixed pool of officers, um, and the, the costs of training are pretty substantial. So like you have to bid wages up pretty high before they really have an impact on drawing people into the labor force um, is, 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 is the important takeaway from that. Um, so, you know, look, the, the other thing that there are a couple of other things cities are doing. One is that it's very practical streamlining stuff. It can take a long time to go from, you know, pretty, sending in a job application to uh, actually deploying a cop on the street. Some of that's good, but some of that can be like, some of that's training time, but some of that's just like paperwork time um, that you can cut down on. And the other thing is just like, ultimately cops want to go to cities where people don't hate them. Like that's just the most important factor. You know, I, I, I talk to cops who will leave a, a metropolitan department to go work in an adjoining suburban department. Like they don't move. Like it's not actually good for public safety if they work in a low crime suburb. You want cops where the crime is. But right. what they say to me is like, I, when I, you know, when I, when I'm out on patrol, like people wave to me, they like are nice to me. They greet me. They're like, we like you. We're glad that we have you in our neighborhood. It keeps us safe. And that wasn't true when I worked in Seattle or Portland or one in San Francisco, like people would spit on me and yell at me. And I didn't like that. So I'm leaving. Um, and so I think cities will, are successful at hiring insofar as they clearly communicate. We don't have a large population. We don't have leaders who think that cops should be political punching bags. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah. Um, what about uh, police accountability? I might get in a situation where the system won't have my back. They'll hang me out to dry. I'll end up in jail for making a mistake or even for not making a mistake. Yeah, I mean, you know, and there's 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 a double-edged sword there, right? Like, you want to, it's important for bad cops to be held accountable, right? They're, it's First of all, it's good when people commit crimes are punished. And second of all, it's particularly important that when public servants commit crimes or otherwise harm the public, they are held accountable for that behavior. Um, you know, the, the, the sort of space where this gets talked about a lot is in, uh, the, the thing that gets talked about a lot here is police unions. Um, and like, I'm... yeah. I'm a conservative. I'm skeptical of public sector unions. I don't love them. And I think that there are probably adverse consequences associated with them. But yeah. the research as I read it, um, and I've written, a, I've written about this on Substack, actually, the research as I read it is much more equivocal on the effect of police unions, specifically on uh, use of force, on complaints against police officers, measures not just of like how much of the tax dollars are cops drawing, but... Like how bad are you know how bad are they being and are we protecting bad apples? Um, my interpretation is the best estimate is that police adding a police union neither increases nor decreases uh, the risk of those bad outcomes. Um, why? I think a good model is that police unions will cover cops' butt on the front end. Like they will, that's their job. They will stand up for him even if he's accused of doing something, often unreasonably. But I would just say they'll stand up for him unreasonably. Um, but they also, because they're in that role, we have evidence in Chicago, actually, that suggests that police unions also go out of their way to discourage use of force. They message internally to say, you need to cover, you, you know, you need to make sure that we look good. Um, and that appears to have some positive effect on reducing use of force. Um, so, I'd say, you know, you don't see a huge amount of negotiation, or I have not seen a huge amount of negotiation along that dimension for police hiring currently. But I am also, I think that the relationship is not all that obvious there. That, um, you know, in, intuitively, I would say it makes sense to think that like less accountability would be a benefit for cops and people would negotiate along it. And you would see this in things like uh, Officer Bill of Rights or uh, police, or, you know, public sector organizing. But I think the evidence that exists is much, is much weaker then would merit a strong conclusion there. I see. Public sector unions. Uh, another guest I had on the show a while ago, Philip K. Howard, uh, has, has a book out of, I can't remember the title of it now, but we'll find it, uh, basically making a sustained argument against public sector unions as being unconstitutional or uh, some such. And, you know, I, the idea that... Uh, the politicians and the uh, are taking money from the unions and they're sitting down negotiating contracts and uh, the poor taxpayer is footing the bill but is not necessarily at the table but who have his, his interests represented is kind of disconcerting. But that's true of teachers' unions as well, isn't it? Right. I mean, look, I'm, I'm, I'm intuitively against public sector unions and I suspect that those, those particular harms probably obtain in the case of police unions, although I haven't you know, I haven't seen evidence either way. Um, that said, you know, my, my claims are narrow, which is that police unions, the presence or absence of police unions doesn't do a lot to explain use of force or complaints against police officers. And that's important from the perspective of, you know, are police unions a specific problem? Um, more generally, there's this, there's this like tendency to sort of go look for the silver bullet in like discouraging police misconduct, right? We talk about civil asset forfeiture, we talk about qualified immunity, we talk about public sector unions, and we go, if we just got rid of those, you know, if we just changed, uh, we, we talk at the 1033 program, right? we talk about like police militarization and the feds are handing off, you know, tanks to cops, and we look at all these things and we go, well, if we just change those things, that would be peachy keen. And it turns out that like, when you look under the hood of each of those things, it's actually very hard to argue that they are having like an appreciable impact on uh on like the things that people are really worried about with policing that they're having an appreciable impact on use of force that they're causing you know police homicide unjustifiable police homicides um you know well, I think do you the, think the, excuse me for interrupting i just want to ask do you think there's anything that can be done that would materially uh reduce the frequency of the police inappropriate uh use of force against civilians 
Um, so I, I sometimes I get called in. I have, you know, I have friends who are professors, and they know that I'm sort of right leaning, and they have colleagues who teach classes on policing, and their colleagues go, you know, all my kids think that the police should like all be hanged. And I don't think that, but I don't know how to tell them that. Do you know anybody who can come guest lecture in <laughs> class? And I get called in. To get, I've, done this, I've done this lecture in like three or four different classes at this point where I sort of show up and go like, here is the moderate case for like cops are good and the situation is tractable and you shouldn't burn it all down. What I say in the relevant portion of this talk is there are solutions. They are very boring. Um, <laughs> like they are they're not sexy. They are not clever, but they do work. Um, so body worn cameras, uh, there was a lot of empirical back and forth about body worn cameras. Um, the early studies said that they didn't do a lot. It turns out the reason for this to get like really nitty gritty is failure of randomization. Um, people who were supposed to wear the cameras didn't and people who weren't supposed to wear the cameras did they get around this. The most recent biggest studies show that they have effects. They have, you know, statistically significant. Are they enormous effects? No, we're talking like 10%. 10%. 10% isn't nothing. Um, de-escalation training, for a long time, there was actually no evidence that de-escalation... I mean, okay, there was, there was like really low quality evidence. Like people would do survey, you know, you'd give de-escalation training and they'd be like, do you feel like this training has reduced your chance of beating the crap out of a black guy? And people would say <laughs> yes, um, which isn't evidence of anything. Um, in 20, like 2019, something like that, we get a randomized trial of de-escalation training. It has effects. It has positive effects. Um, that's, you know, that, that that's not very exciting, but it works. Um, and then the other one that I'll talk about is uh, officer retention. There is research, again, out of Chicago, which shows holding lots of other fact- factors equal. Cops who serve on the force longer are better in a variety of situations. They use force less. They arrest less. Um, and like having, you know, done ride alongs with cops, talk to cops, this makes sense to me. The older, more experienced guys are just like, they're better at handling civilians. They know how to negotiate. They know how to treat people well. Um, those guys, like, you know, the, the rookies I know are often jumpy. They're like, you know, they're, maybe they have too much bravado. And the older guys are like, they, they, they know that their job is about dealing with people who are often in you know, high intensity, challenging situations, they're better at it. And so, you know, retain retention is underrated as like, that's a very unsexy issue. We need to improve police retention, and that will have a 10% reduction in use of force or whatever. Like that's, you know, you've already fallen asleep when I say that, but it is it probably <laughs> works. Um, and improving retention improves the quality of policing. Uh, none of these is silver bullet solutions, right? These are like 10 to 20% solutions. Um, but you get a bunch of 10 to 20% solutions, like that starts to add up. So it is possible. It is possible to make those things better. Yeah. Uh, I want to shift the subject again, and because I noticed you've been writing a lot about drug control policy and about alcohol. And I'm not sure that that's unrelated to talking about crime and and, and public safety issues, but uh, what are your sort of big think insights uh, in the area of uh, drugs? And, and alcohol. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, the, the, the overlap, my interest in general is in sort of think about is like the policy of antisocial behavior. Um, how, do you, how do you deal with, how do you deal with uh, behavioral issues, whether it be criminal offending or drug use or uh, public disorder? Like what, what is the right mix of carrot and stick? What is the right policy approach to addressing those issues? Um, how do you think of drugs? I mean, drugs are, you know, it's a huge issue. What I would say at the start is that I think that we we are currently in a period of systematically underrating what a problem drugs are. Um, And that may seem surprising because everyone sort of pays lip service to Everyone sort of is like, yeah, this is a drug crisis. Um, But like, we don't really act like it's a crisis. Um, 100,000, it's probably 110,000 people die from drug overdose. That was last year. Um, That's actually the standard over the past two to three years. like drugs are an, drug overdose is an enormous problem. Uh, we don't really think a lot about how to address it. We still sort of treat it like it isn't nearly, you know, the 100,000 figure, that's like a five-fold increase over 10 years ago, like a 10-fold increase over 20 years ago. It's an enormous increase in deaths. Um, but I think we were also, across the board, much more sanguine about addictive substances than we were 30 years ago. Um, 
you know, there's a theory that like drugs and drug culture go in cycles, and alcohol is involved in this too, where our level of, you know, we we learn about a drug, we try it, we're really excited about it, um, we start to experience the adverse harms of it, uh, we swing wildly in the other direction, we ban it, we regulate it away, we become naive, and then we try it again. And I think you you know you saw the cycle at the start of the 20th century. Um, before we actually prohibited drugs, uh, you saw the cycle again in the '60s and '70s um, with both marijuana, with marijuana and cocaine, uh, heroin too in the '60s, um, and then we're st- I think starting to see it again. So you see it in the illicit drug use, sort of hard, quote unquote, hard drug use. Uh, you see it with the transition to fentanyl, the spread of methamphetamine again, its sort of expansion. Um, but you also see it in growing use of marijuana. You see it in growing use of psychedelics. Um, people are starting to notice that like large fractions of our popu- of our juvenile population is hooked on amphetamines in the form of Adderall uh, to often seriously debilitating effect. Um, so so all let me of this get, problem, like, yeah, I just want to ask whether it's appropriate to draw any lines here, heart drugs and recreational and all of that, uh, and Adderall use, which is a, yet another thing. Are you lumping them all together inappropriately, or at least I just want to get you to address that? Yeah. So the answer is yes and no. Um, you know, is is it is it every every addictive substance is different in the way that it affects users. It's different in the way that uh, you know in what its risks and harms are. Um, you know, for example, so like take something like cigarettes. Um, smoking one cigarette, very few acute harms. Uh, your risk of you know nicotine toxicity is basically nil. Very large chronic harms. Uh, something like something like um, uh, I don't know um, amphetamine. Your acute harm risk is much higher, but you have a long term harm risk. Uh, marijuana is much acute in chronic harms. The, the the point is, it is you know when it, when we talk about like can you say some drugs are pretty bad and some drugs are not? What I really like to say is like. Drugs have different risk profiles and you need to regulate accordingly. That's certainly true. The other thing I would say is you can, you know, you, you can extract a like general factor of uh, toleration for drugs. You can say like the way in which we regard drugs and their and their tolerability tends to swing together over time. That in periods where we are using one substance, we are using another substance as well. And our capacity as a society to respond to substances seems to struggle to differentiate them. Um, so in that regard, I think that it makes sense to sort of say, we are in a period, one of these historical periods, where we are comparatively more sanguine about drug use um, across a variety of spectrum. Uh, excuse me, across the spectrum of substances. And that, that, uh, trans, you know, that, that, that we sort of try to draw these lines is in part like a product of we are trying to become more sanguine about some substances that like we sort of worry about meth use, but we don't worry about recreational amphetamine use, even though they're kind of the same substance um, that we think about cigarettes and marijuana as being wildly different, even though in many ways they're quite similar. You know, this is this is a function of we pick and choose which substances we want to tolerate. But my assertion is like in part we are we are moving towards the impulses towards uh, an increase in tolerance generally, all else being equal. Now, okay. What role has criminalization of use the legal system to play in what's a larger social um, management problem. You know, if you got Adderall and you got cannabis and you got alcohol, we haven't even mentioned alcohol, that presumably has to be in the discussion. Uh, You know, we're not going to go back to the days of prohibition on uh, alcohol and every uh, jurisdiction has got a referendum now about legalizing cannabis, it seems. Uh, So, where are you in, in, in that debate about criminalization? Yeah, I mean, so I think that we can say a couple of things. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's sort of a, there's sort of a you know, what should people have the right to do conversation, um, which we can get into. But I think that everyone actually has very conflicting intuitions here, right? Like, I, I know you, the, the people who are consistent on that front are, 
uh, people who believe that heroin should be legal and sold in vending machines. I know those people. I believe they're consistent and wrong, and nobody's going to listen to them, at least not currently. Um, everybody else thinks that there's a balance of costs and benefits that is relevant to play out here, right? Like, you know, there's some benefit to letting people use heroin. Like, heroin's fun. Um, but then on the other hand, there are also lots of costs to letting, like, Walmart sell you heroin out of vending machines and the costs outweigh the benefits. Um, what I would say from the perspective of enforcement is that there are different components of enforcement. Um, there is prohibition per se, and then there is how prohibition is enforced. Uh, let me give you an example. Until now, six years ago, sports gambling, and gambling is addictive, sports gambling was prohibited in most states. It had been prohibited for about 30 years. Extremely low levels of enforcement. They were like, fewer than 3,000 arrests a year nationwide for gambling-related offenses. Um, but also, there was like basically, there, there was very little what we may call industrialized or commercialized sports gambling. They're like, you know, little, little, little gambling operations. They weren't very efficient. 2018, the Supreme Court says, okay, we're going we're gonna to strike down the relevant law. 30 plus states now, the fed, relevant federal law, 30 plus states now have sports gambling. You can gamble on your phone. Uh, it's, if you've ever watched a sporting event, you are barraged with ads about sports gambling. And it's, it's having very real disquieting. Harm. It, yeah. I, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I don't like it, to be honest with you. Maybe I'm just an old fashioned guy, but, you know, they're telling me to bet on the game while I'm watching the game. Uh, we, we know that. Uh, I, I forget the numbers, but it's something like five in New Jersey's data, five sixty percent of the expenditures come from five percent of users. Like those are problem gamblers. They will lose all their money. Some of them will uh, do serious harm to their lives. Some of them will commit suicide. This has been the experience of the UK that legalized sports gambling fifteen years ago. It's extremely bad. It's a very standard what happens when you let big retailers sell addictive substances. So prohibition per se, which is just like Basically, what prohibition does is it makes it hard for businesses to operate effectively, um, to operate economically. You you lose lots of efficiencies when you're prohibited from interacting with the financial system, uh, from advertising, from like selling. It becomes hard to sell stuff across borders. Then we talk about enforcement, right? Like there is there's a very wide range of possible levels of enforcement. Um, you know, between 1970 and 1990, we almost exponentially increased the level of enforcement in the United States, the drug enforcement specifically. The number of people who are getting arrested, um, the number of people who ended up incarcerated. I think what we can now say from that experiment, and I'm willing to sort of defend the like, like I actually, I don't think that experiment was as crazy at the time as we take it to be now. But I think what we can say from that experiment is it kind of, it didn't work. Um, that, you know, this, this is the war on drugs that you're talking about. This is about. the war on drugs. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm willing to defend, I think the war on drugs was in ways nobler than we give it credit for. But what I think you saw was, there's, it comes down to, uh, it comes down to elasticities, right? So like, you, 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 for, for the benefit of your listeners, um, elasticities are, if you increase the price of something by 1%, what is the percentage change in consumption of that price? Uh, if you increase the level of enforcement, um, you will have an effect on the level of consumption of a good, uh, of a prohibited good. Um, but we have good empirics now to say that the elasticity of consumption for addictive substances depends on whether or not you're addicted. So what we saw is that in the 80s, there's a big burst of enforcement. And like the number of people who consume actually craters pretty substantially. Like between late 1970s and early 1980s, uh, so the late 1980s, number of high schoolers, number of Americans, there are many fewer people consuming drugs. And then it like flattens out, and measures of the total number of drugs consumed basically remain flat. And what that tells you is that like, so casual users have a fairly elastic response to enforcement. They stop using. That's good. Um, but then once you've convinced all the casual users to stop using, adding additional enforcement you're trying to target people who are addicted to the substance, and they have a fairly inelastic demand for drugs. Um, and so mostly what you are doing with that population is like cycling them through the jail system without actually taking the steps you need to reduce their use. So you're not making the problem any better. So what I end up saying, I have a paper coming out about this in a couple of months, is yeah. prohibition is beneficial in general for substances you want to control. Um, some level of enforcement is important for controlling the extent of casual use. 
after a certain level, you hit diminishing marginal returns pretty rapidly, and you need to start thinking about other more public health-oriented strategies. That was a very long answer, but that is sort of the, the no. Big that's thing good. That's back, you, you're back to your you're back to your extensive margin, intensive margin <laughs> uh, point. And I'm wondering about how that intersects with frequent offenders who come into the criminal justice system, and While we have the captive audience, we have their attention when they're being detained, whether there aren't policies that are uh, motivated by a desire to reduce uh, the harmful effects of drug and alcohol consumption in that population. And have you given any thought to that? Yeah. um, Well, and so, you know, I think that there are... Mm. The, there, there is a fair amount mm, in addressing the drug crisis, and here I'm talking specifically about overdose death and sort of the hard drugs. There's a lot of low hanging fruit to be picked in terms of treatment. Um, treatment and drug treatment in America is kind of a mess. Uh, we have a very patchwork system. People don't move into it. We struggle to get people into treatment. We struggle to give them effective treatment when they're in it. A lot of treatment doesn't work. Um, like you're, you know, if you go, if you just like go to opioid detox, you get detox, you get back out. Your risk, your relapse risk is like ninety percent. Um, it doesn't do anything. Um, so we talk about, uh, you know, one one piece of low hanging fruit that I like to talk about that's illustrative is as of twenty nineteen five year old data, there are there are three medications the FDA has approved for treating opioid addiction: um, uh, methadone, buprenorphine, naltrexone. Um, as of 2019, one state in the union, Rhode Island, deploys all three of those drugs in its prisons and jails. Um, that's a stylized fact, but it's like, you know, that's a very specific fact, but it's like, you have, it, p- p- people who are addicted to drugs often cycle through the prison or jail system, whether or not drugs are legal, um, whether or not drugs are decriminalized, how, depend, regardless of the intensity of enforcement. Um, you ha- do have a captive population. Uh, you can expose them to treatment there. That isn't the only place you want to expose them to treatment. You want to expose them to treatment in lots of different possible circumstances. Sometimes you want to civilly commitment, commit them. There's actually reasonably decent evidence of that having efficacy. Um, but yeah, like, like you know, when, when, when I was talking earlier about after, after a certain point you hit diminishing marginal returns in enforcement, within that population of hardcore users, what you need to do is shift their behavior to the best of your ability. And that looks like like basically long-term medication-assisted treatment and moving as many people through that as possible. Um, and then I, you know, I've, I've argued like that is a particular urgency today because drugs are much deadlier than they used to be. Um, that, you know, it, the, the, the fact that I like to use is in the late 1980s at the peak of the crack crisis, the drug OD death rate was three deaths for every 100,000 Americans. Today, it's like 33 deaths for every 100,000 Americans. Drug use, much deadlier than it used to be. And so the urgency of getting those people off of drugs and keeping them durably off of drugs is much higher. Um, and they haven't really caught up uh, with, with the level of urgency necessary. I see. Um, well. I wanted to ask you about something a little bit different now. Uh, That's about hate crimes. I I noticed that you've done some writing about that as well. Uh, Are we undercounting uh, hate crimes by not imputing hatred motives in certain kinds of cases? So, for example, if a white guy takes a baseball bat and attacks a black guy, the suspicion might be that it's a hate crime, but if a black person does that to a white person, maybe, um, and this is meant to be a question. I'm not, I don't mean to make it as a statement. The general question I'm trying to ask is how can we identify uh, hate crime, or should we be trying? I mean, because it could be an argument that, you know, you don't punish people for uh, the intent, you punish them for the action or something like that. Yeah, so I have a, I have sort of a, <laughs> The way that I think about this issue is to try to avoid it entirely. Um, so so <laughs> nobody knows how many hate crimes there are in the United States. Um, estimates range between like, you know, 9,000 a year and like 300,000 a year. It depends on which data source you use. It's very silly. Um, and, and part of the problem there is that nobody can agree what a hate crime is. Um, that That it's hard to measure. First of all, that people don't report when they're... The things that people think are hate crimes are not necessarily hate crimes. 
People don't necessarily report hate crimes. Hate crimes don't necessarily get reported in the data. It's just really hard to know. So, you know, what I would say about the question of like, should we impute motive? Or, no, like it's it's extremely hard to do reliably. Yeah. That's not what you want to do in a criminal justice system. It is the case. So, like, I've spent time with hate crime, you know, arrest reports, and it's like it's usually pretty clear why it was a hate crime, right? Like, like you know, I I think about uh, there's one where like a guy gets arrested in New York because he like lights the flat the gay pride flags in front of a gay club on fire. Um, and he's arrested for arson with a hate crime enhancement. It's like, yeah, that was probably bias motivated. I think like you could convince a jury of that. That's reasonable. Um, but you have to look for like some external sign of hatred. The the group membership is not enough. Um, but you know, the, the other thing I would say is like ultimately thinking at motives is not the most useful component of hate crimes. The two things that I say with regards to hate crime are one, hate crimes. Hate crime enhancements are, in my mind, which say, you know, harsher sentences for bias-motivated offenses relative to if the offense was not provably bias-motivated are justified because hate is its own independent harm, right? Like, getting punched in the face because I'm Jewish hurts more than getting punched in the face. Um, or, alternately, my getting punched in the face because I'm Jewish does some harm that you want to internalize to non-Jewish people who live near me. Or, and this is the tertiary argument, the state, in addition to its interest in law and order, also has an interest in sort of de minimis standards of conduct, right? Like, like we live in a free society. People are allowed to believe hateful things. Um, that's like, you know, uh, something like yeah. 5% of Americans still profess to believe that interracial marriage is wrong. That's their right. That's fine. Like, I, I don't like yeah. it, but they are entitled to that right. Um, but the state has some interest in saying you can't, violently act on that right that, on that belief like you we're, we're going to draw the line there and it's we are going to require tolerance in you know limiting criminal behavior the other thing though that i observe and i think you know is under discussed in this conversation is that hate crime offenders are not specialists they commit lots of cr other non-hate crimes as well <laughs> um and i you know I, I i showed this in new york city data there's lots of other um Research that confirms this in U.S. and U.K. data. Uh, it's not like there's a special class of like people who only offend because of bias motivation. Most hate crimes are actually probably like like crimes of opportunity. You know, it's often like the things that get charged as hate crimes are like you know uh, like a group of teenagers sees like an immigrant and they like beat the crap out of him while calling him racial slurs. Um, and that group of teenagers probably commits other crimes as well, measurably commits other crimes as well. And so the real argument in my mind for hate crime enforcement is that these are, uh, these are often non-specialist offenders. And so if you don't get them on the hate crime, you're going to end up getting them, ideally getting them on something else. And if you can, to go back to the theme of that incapacitation earlier, if you can pick up those non-specific offenders or those, those general offenders early on, regardless of what you get them on, uh, it's probably good. By the way, the, the corollary of this is that like, you mostly want to use the criminal justice system for dealing with hate crime. You don't want to like, you know, do anti-bias education in schools or, you know, give money to community organizations to reduce hate. It's like really hard to reduce hate. We don't have evidence-based interventions for reducing hate. We have evidence-based interventions for reducing crime. And so if we think about it as a crime issue and as a subset of the other crime issue, lots of the cultural baggage goes away. You're just like, it, you probably shouldn't get to yell a racial slur while you're beating the crap out of a guy and you should go to prison or, you know, you should be punished for beating the crap out of the guy and like, yeah, sure, yeah, add a year because he was yelling a racial slur while he did it. Are you worried about immigration on the crime supply front? Um, you know, what, what I like to say here is it's, it's basically never useful to talk about immigrants as a category independent of who the immigrants are. Um, I, I have, I have some, you know, an, an acquaintance who worked on a paper who showed that the large increase in homicide in the early 20th century can be explained by the level of immigration to a given area. Um, uh, but then he further shows that that effect goes away once you control for the fact that most of those immigrants were young men. Um, so it's not that they're immigrants, it's that we brought a lot of unpaired young men to the United States and unpaired young men are who commits crime. Um, the same thing goes for like for for contemporary immigrant offending. You know, I am sympathetic to the argument that any any person who is here who, who commits a crime 
isn't entitled to continue to be here. I think on average, immigrants don't seem to have higher crime rates than the native born population. By some measures, their crime rates are lower. But that also just like misses the point, which is that immigrants are not a uniform group. There are, j- j- just like within American society, uh, 90% of the crimes are committed by men versus 10% by women. If you import a lot of young men, your crime rate will go up. If you, if you have a bunch of like uh, paired men or women or children, your crime rate probably won't go up. And that's you know, the factor that I end up looking for is like, where are they coming from? And what sort of people are they? Thanks very much, Charles. Uh, my guest has been Charles Fain Lehman. He is a fellow at the Manhattan Institute, very knowledgeable and careful observer of the policy scene in the policing and criminal justice area. It's been, I've learned a lot from talking to you and I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank, thanks for having me on. I'm uh, glad to have made it. 